like I said, I fell off really hard. Ended up getting involved with, there was a witch out here from, from Breckenridge. You know, he was deep into the occult. And um, one thing led to a next. And uh, I had stuck a needle back in my arm and it was like, I was off to the races all over again. So I had one foot in the church, one foot, you know, kind of still sitting at the table with demons, you know. Um, and then one day, man, I was, uh, I was in my bedroom and I was having full blown conversations on my phone with, with demons. I mean, literally. Uh, they were coming through my phone, coming out of my TV. Um, I remember my floor, I was like getting shocked on my floor. I was like feeling electrocution coming through my floor. It was super wild. Legit scientists right now are positing that we live in a simulation. I feel like a lot of stuff is going on in the world that's brought up a lot of these conversations, even in our last couple episodes, just with UAP disclosure and, you know, the Nephilim agenda that we always come back to. The world largely rejects their message and treats them as hostile extraterrestrials who must be stopped at any cost. Hey campers, welcome back to another episode of Camp Herman. Chris and Tori in the house tonight. Unfortunately, Tori, Mikey Stibbs was going to join us, but he's not feeling well. Oh man. I know, such a bummer. But we've got Tori here. Ride or die from day one. <laughs> Chris and Tori. So, Tori, how you been doing? I haven't talked, I feel like I haven't talked to you in a little while. I was on vacation last week. What have you been up to? That's right. You know, I took a little trip too. I went um, to explore some caves in Arkansas this last weekend, which was super fun. But we can catch up about that in a fireside chat later. Yeah. Do you want to do a fireside chat tonight, Tori? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Dope. All right. So for members, fireside chat tonight. So stick around uh, at the end of this episode. Tori and I are going to Kind of catch up with you all and let you know what we've been what we've been up to recently. Okay, so before I introduce our guest, I wanted to talk about our sponsor, Kevlar Joe. If you are a fellow caffeine addict and you enjoy coffee, check out Kevlar Joe. If you haven't already, you can go to kevlarjoe.com. It is a hundred percent organic, ethical, artisan veteran owned and operated and if you use the promo code campermon10 you get 10 percent off so enjoy that on tonight's show we have got sean ray from wrong to strong ministries sean thank you for joining us brother it's a pleasure thanks for having me absolutely so sean you have a fascinating story um so i know we're going to dig into that tonight but what I'd love for you to do is just introduce yourself to our audience. Absolutely. So my name is Sean Ray. As you said, I'm from a ministry called Wrong to Strong. Um, I lead Bible studies over there now, Zoom Bible studies. But um, we, we're, we're kind of reaching coast to coast now um, with what we're doing with the ministry that God's blessed us with. A uh, bunch of guys coming off the streets, uh, predominantly Chicago, but all over the place and stuff. Um, you know, guys getting saved. Spirit of God is pulling us out of darkness and pulling us into the light. And uh, God has gifted me with the ability to to reach and to shepherd these people. And so um, blessed to be in this ministry. Um, I'm an evangelist at heart. So first and foremost, man, I like to hit the streets. I like to bring the gospel to the streets. I like to reach people. I like to reach people with the love of Christ because uh, that's what set me free. Um, eight years ago, I was in an abandoned building. I was actually all the way in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, I would reach the end of myself. I've been running from myself for about 29 years. Uh, I was a hardcore heroin addict. Um, you know, I gang banged for, you know, since I was about a teenager. And, uh, so that was my life, you know? Um, but I had a loving grandmother in my life who passed away in 2011, but she told me before then that she would die praying for me. And, uh, that's exactly what she did when, you know, she passed away in 2011, um, multiple myeloma. And uh, I was in probably the darkest place I had ever been in my life. You know, I was dope sick at her funeral. And so um, a few years later, I think it was August 2015, I ended up in an abandoned building in Camden, New Jersey. And I cried out to Jesus. I said, Jesus, if you're real, I said, if you're the God that my grandmother says that you are, then you'll save my life right now because I want to die. 
You know, I had spent my entire life on the streets, in and out of prisons, you know, from from Illinois to Minneapolis, Minnesota, all the way down to Tampa, Florida. And, and so, like I said, I just spent most of my life running from myself till I cried out to Jesus in that abandoned building. Uh, right after I cried out to the Lord, I stepped out of that abandoned building and there was a ministry right there in the middle of the hood. Um, kind of spooked me a little bit because I had this little coming to Jesus moment, you know, and so I tried to ignore him, but I ended up in the middle of this circle, of people that laid hands on me and prayed for me. And literally two days later, I was on a bus to a discipleship program in Colorado Springs called U-Turn for Christ. And uh, it saved my life. You know, it was like a, it was like kind of like a spiritual boot camp of sorts. Um, and it was definitely for me, you know, just kind of coming from the streets and coming from just kind of that military mindset with the gangs and stuff like that. It was, it was perfect. It was a two, two phase program. First phase was in house. You, you don't leave the program. It's uh, it's not 12 steps. It was one step, Jesus Christ. And we just studied the word of God and went to, went to services and stuff. But uh, when I got there, I went through one of the most intense withdrawals I'd ever went through in my life. Uh, it lasted for about 30 days, you know, coming off, coming off the drugs and the streets and stuff like that. Um, it was pretty intense. Um, but after about nine days in, I remember I finally made it to a service and I heard the gospel preached. And for the first time, I actually felt I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And um, it just dropped me to my knees and I gave my life to Christ that day. Um, ended up going through another, you know, couple weeks of intense withdrawals, but I uh, never forgot that experience. And um, uh, by the time I got out of there, um, I had learned, you know, a lot about the word. Uh, I've been going to a lot of the different Calvary churches out here in Colorado, um, from like Denver all the way to Canyon City. And so um, the Lord really kind of uh, equipped me in the word. Um, but when I left the program, I was still lost. You know, I still had a lot of I started dealing with a lot of PTSD, you know, coming off the streets. I uh, was dealing with a lot, a lot of demonic attacks. I could tell the enemy didn't want to let me go um, for quite some time. And, um, you know, I had night tremors and just, you know, all type of just voices and things going on and um, a lot of de demonic activity and stuff that I was dealing with. And um, uh, by this time, I had met my now wife. Um, she was the secretary of, of our home church um, out here in Colorado Springs. And, um, I ended up falling hard. You know, I ended up getting lost all over again. Like I said, my past, everything just kind of caught up with me. You know, I felt like a soldier coming back from war, man, you know, like, um, I never really understood PTSD. And I guess, I guess you really don't when you're kind of going and living that life. Um, it's not till afterwards when those things, you know, you're, you kind of slow your life down a little bit and those things kind of catch up with you, you know, and so it was like the floodgates opened up, man, and just started dealing with a lot of stuff. And like I said, I fell off really hard, um, ended up getting involved. But there was a witch out here from from Breckenridge that I worked with um, in this butcher shop. And, you know, he was deep into the occult. And, you know, he started talking about things that, you know, I was familiar with coming from the gangs and stuff like that, as far as, you know, just uh, a lot of occult literature and things like that. There was things he was saying that I was like, man, how do you know this stuff, you know? Um, one thing led to a next, you know, we ended up hanging out in his garage one night and uh, I had stuck a needle back in my arm and it was like I was off to the races all over again. Uh, I went went when I went on for about eight months, eight, nine months. Um, at this time, my wife, um, we had gotten married and, um, you know, I kind of kept it hidden for a while. I was still kind of going to church. I had one foot in the church, one foot, you know, kind of still sitting at the table with demons, you know, and, um, the Lord, uh, revealed to me just kind of what I was doing. And, uh, my wife was praying for me really heavy. Um, we, we weren't actually living in the, in the same room together, but she was in a separate room and she was just praying for me, praying for me, praying for me. Um, and then one day, man, I was, uh, I was in my bedroom and I was having full blown conversations on my phone with, with demons. I mean, literally, um, they were coming through my phone, coming out of my TV, um, I remember my floor, I was like getting shocked on my floor. I was like feeling electrocution coming through my floor. It was, it was super wild. And then all of a sudden I was about to get high. And then all of a sudden I felt the Holy Spirit fall on me again. Um, right, right before I was about to get high and um, it dropped me to my knees. And I just started crying because I, I felt like the Lord was like wrapping his arms around me. 
And uh, it kind of frustrated me a little bit because I'm like, Lord, why are you loving on me right now? Because, you know, I'm I'm like sinning against you on purpose, kind of, you know, like on purpose, but not on purpose because I was just still so lost and confused. And like, you know, um, like I said, my life had slowed down to the point where I started dealing with all this stuff. But, man, I just felt the Lord wrap his arms around me and loving on me. And, and then I remember it, I, I, I felt like I heard like a snap. It, it was the wildest thing. And it was like all at the same time, it was like all the demons, all the voices, uh, all the anxiety, everything just vanished um, right at right at the same moment. And and I'll never forget that moment because this is what this is what this is why I'm sold out today is because I had this 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 supernatural experience. And I come running out the room. My wife comes running out of her room and we like caught each other in the middle of the hallway because she heard she heard it too like in the spirit she heard like this snap you know and so she wanted to know what was going on she the way she she likens it to like it was like a plane crashing into the ceiling or something i mean yeah. she said it was super loud and so I, I just heard the snap but she heard like this plane crashing so we caught each other in the middle of the hallway and i just grabbed her and i was like in tears and i'm like it's over it's over they're gone the demons are gone everything's gone and she's like, you know, kind of looking at me like, are you sure? Are you sure? You know, and I'm like, I'm I'm for real. I ended up grabbing my headphones. I threw some worship music on. I remember running out across the street into um, into the park that was across the street. And I ran around the park for about three hours because <laughs> I just felt like I was free. Like everything that had been, you know, had been bothering me and just, you know, everything that I was dealing with just all vanished, man. And um, from that point on, man, I was like, I was sold out. Like I was all in. It was like, I felt like I had the encounter that I had been desperately looking for my entire life. And, you know, it just made me, you know, just fall in love with the Lord. And so I ended up falling in love with the word, you know, I ended up, um, joining the worship team at my church and eventually shared my testimony, um, at the Pikes Peak Center out here. And, uh, I watched, you know, a couple hundred people give their lives to the Lord that day and uh, it was super humbling experience. And so um, that just kind of set me on my journey. And, and that was five years ago in August when that happened. And so, you know, God saved me eight years ago, it took another three years, three and a half years um, to get right and just, you know, figure that all out. And then, you know, five years now I've been solid walking with the Lord, um, completely sober, you know, um, and just, yeah, just learning and growing in, in the Lord and stuff. And so uh, I do a lot of evangelism and stuff today. Like I said, I like to go out to the streets and and lay hands on people because, I mean, literally, that's where God got me was 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 right on the yeah. streets, right in the, middle, right in the middle of the hood. And so I'm like, Lord, I'll go to the darkest places wherever you want me to go. I'll go. You know, I feel like growing up in the streets of Chicago, I've been through I've been in some of the darkest areas you could possibly go in this country. You know, South Chicago, man, you know, it's nothing but demons out there, you know. And so I'm like, man, Lord, I feel like I've overcome that. I felt God was with me and I feel like I could do anything. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I could do all things through Christ today, you know. And so, yeah, that's a little little bit of that's, my testimony. Sean, that's amazing, bro. God is so good. Uh, he's so faithful. Like even when we when we jack up. He still loves us and he's still going to going to pursue us. Um, I'd like to go back and talk about what led you into that gang life. And if you don't mind sharing, like what was the what was the gang and then what was the kind of the initiation and things like that? You you had made you had mentioned connections between like the gangs and like a occult practices so like with gangs i know there's like there's like an initiation and i know like with the freemasons like they have initiations they make oaths so i'm just curious if there's that type of similarity between uh what you experienced and you know like mystery schools and secret societies sure yeah so uh where it all started for me i, I had no father my mother left my father when i was two years old i was actually born in norwalk connecticut my mother moved us to Illinois when I was two. Um, she was a teenager. You know, she had she was pregnant with me at 16, had me when she was 17. Um, my grandmother had lived out in Illinois at this time. And so um, she just wanted to be around, you know, her mother and stuff and, and and to get help from her. But my mother was still very lost. So my mother had came out of satanic ritual abuse. Um, this is something I don't I haven't, you know, previously talked about much yet. 
um, because I've learned a lot since some of the last um, interviews and stuff that I've done, just uh, the history of my family and, and why we're so disassociative, even in just uh, just how we how we are. Um, but my mother um, and my my aunt um, grew up in a pretty um, traumatic household. Um, my mother was locked in a room most of the time, um, but her stepfather was a high level Freemason. And um, he would uh, just he would torture my mother. Um, um, pretty, pretty traumatic stuff. I know I don't want to go too detailed into you know what she had to go through because it's that's her story, you know, but my grandmother used to talk about generational curses, you know, when I was younger, you know, she would talk about just things that 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 are in our family that had possibly been passed down to us even as kids and so um my grandmother got saved before I was born um but she she didn't grow up a believer you know um and she went through a lot of just uh, a lot of trauma and stuff like that in her past but uh yeah so there was a lot of spiritual activity already just kind of had manifested in our family through through our generations and stuff and um it made sense to me just kind of the direction that I ended up taking on the streets you know, um, I started getting kicked out of my house when I was nine years old, um, started running the streets really, really young, you know, started doing drugs. By the time I was 11, 12 years old, I was, you know, I was doing cocaine. I was drinking a lot, smoking weed and that kind of stuff. But um, we moved around a lot when I was younger. And so um, I, there was about a year and a half there. I ended up going and staying with my grandparents. And um, my, like I said, my grandmother was saved. And so she, you know, she, she taught me about Jesus and she would bring me to church and, you know, she would just try to help me, you know, and guide me and, and redirect me because she knew I was just a, a, just a broken child. And, you know, my mom took me from my father and I guess, you know, my mom tells me all the time, she's like, yeah, I just couldn't control you. Like there was no control in me, even when, if, from the age of two, you know, she said I was climbing out of windows and hanging out of windows and stuff. And like, you know, I was just a very active kid, you know? And so, um, like I said, by nine, I was out on the streets and stuff, but, um, started getting in trouble, started getting locked up, uh, fought, caught my first felony charge when I was 16 years old. Um, ended up going to a, a prison boot camp in Illinois. Um, when I got out of boot camp, I ended up paroling. This is when I moved to inner city Chicago when I was a teenager. So, uh, I was about 16, 17 years old. I moved to, uh, an area called Pilsen in South Chicago south southwest chicago um end up joining a gang called satan disciples the sds um so they're kind of a notorious gang out there on the south side of chicago um they're part of a a nation called folk nation you got two nations in chicago you got the folk nation and the people nation and uh, they're just different structures of, for, for the gangs and stuff like that um people nation has a lot of uh uh, Islam, nation of Islam and, and religious history and roots to it and stuff like that. Um, the folk nation, you know, also has some of that too. Um, but there is a lot of Freemasonry that is incorporated into the structures of the gangs. Um, that's the whole, you know, like, like the folk nation rides under what's called the six point star. Uh, the people nation rides under what's called the five point star. And so those are just, you know, um, in all actuality, uh, the, the, those who created those structures, Larry Hoover, Jeff Ford, a lot of those guys, um, they were 33rd degree Freemasons. And so um, that's where we got our structure was from the realm of Freemasonry. You know, um, it was kind of passed down into the gangs and it, that's what helped structure and organize the gangs on the streets. Uh, but that didn't happen until the 1970s. So before then, it was just a lot of party crews and, and just like, you know, um, because Chicago was, uh, it's a sanctuary city. So, um, it means like a lot of immigrants come into the city. And so it's always been the history of Chicago has always been, we call it gangster city, you know, way back the mob, you know, the mob was even sent over here as a Freemason organization back when they came here. And so, um, just the structures are just the way Chicago is, is organized, ha has a lot of Masonic roots to it, you know? And so, like I said, a lot of that got ended up getting incorporated into the gangs in the 70s. Um, and so, uh, yeah, as far as like a lot of the occult stuff and stuff like that, that's where a lot of that comes from. Um, but within the Latin gangs, you got what's called the Latin folk nation, which is, is separate kind of from the gangster nation 
the the um, under Larry Hoover and stuff like that. I'm not gonna go too detailed into the how they structure that stuff, but uh, um, but the Latin gangs, man, they they bring a lot of that stuff. You know, the history of a lot of the Latin organizations, you know, have a lot of occult, you know, ties to them, um, especially with the drug industry and stuff like that. And so, you know, they they do different you know seances and stuff over the drugs. They they pray over the drugs and stuff like that. And so. That's kind of how they bleed that stuff into the streets. It, it, it's all, it's all, you know, it's all darkness. You know what I mean? It's all shielded by darkness. And so um, that's how a lot of that stuff gets bled into the gangs. Like I said, I was in a gang called Satan Disciples. Um, you know, the way we look at it is like it, it was, it was to bring fear kind of into, to our, our oppositions and our enemies on the streets, you know? And so you do a lot of things to strike, strike fear into your ops and stuff on the streets. Um, and then we spread, we network, you know, the way Chicago is set up is you got, you got, you'll have like the same gang kind of spread out all over the city and you'll have different chapters throughout the city. Um, but not just in the city that's spread out into the suburbs and now into about 48 out of the 50 States, you know, we've networked our gangs and that's where you kind of get a lot of the geographical stuff. Um, you know, with a lot of the occult stuff that, I, that I talk about, um, most of that stuff, a lot of those guys, especially the lower levels and stuff like that, you don't, you know, you, you're completely kind of blind to, 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 to what's going on. You're just kind of going through the motions, you know, making your way up through the gangs and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But it, it, it's all to gain control. You know, it's all about control and power in, in, in the city. And because I said like Chicago's mobster city, um, the mob built the city back in the early 1800s. And then when the Chicago fire happened, you know, they came back and built 85% of the skyscrapers. And so um, there's an old mob called the Chicago Outfit that uh, kind of runs the the mob activity in the city of Chicago. And so um, that's kind of where we get a lot of our history as far as like, that's what we call ourselves. We don't call it, they don't call ourselves gangs in Chicago. We call ourselves organizations because um, that's technically what we are. We are organizations. And so. Yeah, there are different initiation things you go through. Obviously, to um, to get into most of the gangs, you get beat up. You got to you got to be able to take a beating. You know, you, you got to know that you're able to take a beating in order to be a part of the gang and stuff like that. Um, other gangs, you'll go through what different kind of um, different things in the nation. Like, you know, um, sometimes they'll, they'll send you off on missions, and you got to go. You know, whatever, take care of an op. You know, you got to take take out one of your oppositions and stuff like that. And so. Um, a lot of times that's how you gain stripes. That's how you move your way up into the gangs and stuff like that. But, um, uh, originally to get initiated, you know, you, you got to aid and assist the gang for a while, but eventually you get beat up and get brought into the gang and that's just how it goes. And so I got brought in, um, I was set 17 years old. Uh, so I got brought in at, at uh, what's called Douglas park in Southwest Chicago, 18th in California. Um, so that's uh, a little section called evil side. And so um, it's 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 really kind of uh, so they call Pilsen little village like little Mexico because it's predominantly Latin organizations that are over there. Um, but then you got little pockets on the south, south and southwest side that, that are inter, more interracial, you know, um, see so what happened. A lot of the, a lot of the blacks and Mexicans moved into the city and pushed a lot of the whites out into the suburbs and stuff. And so that's uh, some of the whites that stayed in the city obviously end up joining some of the Latin organizations and stuff. And so that's how I got brought in. I got brought into a Latin organization um, out there on 18th in California. And there ain't too many white boys out there. Um, but you run into the white boys. They're, they're some of the more crazier ones in the gang. <laughs> Cause you, you know, you kind of got to do a little more. You got to be the first one to kind of bust off. You got to be, you know, you got to prove yourself, you know, especially joining an inner, you know, a gang, like a, like a, like a Mexican gang or, a Latin gang, you know, um, you got to kind of prove yourself to these guys. And so, you know, I went through a lot of stuff, man, to just make myself be known, you know, that, that I was righteous, that I was down, you know what I mean? And so, uh, eventually caught a case, man, I was on parole, uh, caught a case, violated my parole. And I went up the road, went to prison and, um, did some time in, in, um, in, uh, Western Illinois correctional called Mount Sterling. Um, and when you go to prison, man, that's where you kind of learn a little bit deeper into the structure of like how the nations are connected and stuff like that. So in prison, you got what's called the United Latin Organization. 
and, and that's filled with other Latin gangs like Imperial Gangsters, Maniac Latin Disciples, Spanish Cobras, you know, Latin Eagles. Um, and so these are other Latin gangs that are also in the city. Um, but when you go to prison, you kind of ride under one banner. You know what I mean? They call it the Latin Folk Nation, United Latin Organization. And so um, that's where you kind of learn a little bit deeper into the structures of how the gangs are set up and stuff. Um, Cause out on the streets, man, it's, it's block against block, you know, back in the nineties and stuff like that, there was a lot more organization in the gangs, um, you know, but when they started locking up a lot of the leaders like Larry Hoover and Jeff Fort, and uh, you know, I'm going to, I'll just, I'll just stick with those guys. Cause they're actually over here in Florence, Colorado now doing the rest of their lives in prison. Um, but uh, they got locked up and that splintered the gangs you know, that ended up just, it was like every block for himself kind of after that. And so that kind of disintegrated the leadership and the gangs and stuff like that. And, um, and so you also in, in the city of Chicago, Chicago's a hub. See, Chicago is a center hub for, for a lot of cartels. Um, within the Latin organizations, you got, you know, predominantly the Sinaloa cartel is set up out there in Chicago. And so you get a lot of drugs and stuff that are pushed into the city of Chicago and, you know, a lot of us street gangs, you know, are involved with a lot of the, the cartel activity. And um, so I actually was familiar with a couple of the Latin King twins, the two twins um, from Chicago who actually um, got El Chapo set up on a wiretap. And um, he was we were the reason why I mean, they were the reason why, you know, El Chapo ended up getting caught, get, getting busted. Um, and so that just goes to show how deep our ties are in the city, you know, Um and so that's where a lot of the drug, a lot of the occult activity, you know, when we talk about mystery schools and stuff like that, that stuff's all bled into, you know, the order, you know what I'm saying? The way, the way the gangs are ordered and structured and stuff. And so, you know, if you, if you can go into the history of the mystery schools and stuff that dates back, you know, to Babylon and even before, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's, it goes all the way back to antediluvian, you know, pre-flood, you know, all that stuff. And, and so I learned a little bit more of that as I as I got after I got saved and then I started to go deeper into the history of how this stuff like because I was seeing a lot of stuff, you know, within the gang um, literature, within our oaths, within our prayers, with even in, in our handshakes and stuff. So, you know, that's that's what I mean is like a lot of this stuff is incorporated into the gang structures. Um, like we got handshakes, we got prayers, we got oaths, we got laws, we got bylaws, we got literature. You know, all of this stuff is like, you know, you got to memorize these things, man. And, and and you get checked on that stuff. So like with me being an SD, we have a certain, you know, set of literature that we and prayers um, that unite us as that specific organization and every organization in the city. And in Chicago, you got over 200 different gangs in the city. You know, they all have their own, you know, kind of gang literature and stuff. Um, within the folk nation, you got a lot of the sim same prayers, the same creeds, boss creed, like oaths and stuff like that, um, that unify us as, as folks. But then you have the gangs have their own set of literature that ties them into that specific organization. And so, um, so yeah, that's, that's where a lot of that stuff gets ties in, tied into, you know, um, like I said, the structures were, they came, they came from somewhere. You know, it wasn't just some organic thing that just kind of popped up and like, oh, we're going to do this one day. No, it, it came from somewhere. You know, th this this stuff is ancient history, especially in the city of Chicago, man. It's they call it the brotherhood, you know. Um, and so it's, you know, predominantly like especially if 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 you're a part of a secret, you know, because they are there's they're secret societies. You know, you can you can call it whatever you want, but it's a satanic cult, to be honest with you, you know. And so. um you get a lot of that through the history, but if you're, if you're a part of that organization, you know, it's silence and secrecy, you know, that stays within the bodies of the organizations, you know? So like, I couldn't go, you know, just spit my lip for, for, for just some random person, you know, I'd get, I'd get violated for that. I get a lot of trouble for that. You know, we used to say this for D's, this ain't for those <laughs> meaning man, like you, you don't share this, this stuff. It's, it's, it's silence and secrecy. You know, that's our number, that's our number one law, you know? And so, because of what you have to go through to be a part of it, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it ain't, it ain't something that they take lightly. They take it seriously, especially in the city of Chicago. Um, but nowadays, like I said, the gangs are so splintered. They're so, you know, uh, they're without order and structure. It's like, a lot of these young folks out here, man, they, they've kind of created their own little sets within sets, 
you know? Um, and so like a lot of that stuff is, is kind of gone out the window. Um, and I feel like they'll, they'll take anybody nowadays. You know, I feel like it's more about numbers. It's more about power. It's more about, you know, uh, um, just running the streets and organizing the streets and stuff. But there's a lot of gang wars in Chicago. You know, a lot of guys grow up in the city, man. They don't leave the four square radius that they were raised, that they were born in. You know, I know guys that, that are right on the inner city, but have never seen downtown. You know, they, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, you get told from the time that, that you're brought up in the gangs, like, man, don't go over there. That's these guys, you know, that, that, that gang's over there. If you get caught over there, you know, they're going to, they're going to take you out or whatever. Well, um, a lot of that is a stigma, especially now, especially nowadays, back in the nineties, seventies, eighties, nineties, and stuff like that. It was a lot more serious nowadays. You got, you know, you got gangs that are going over here, going over there and stuff. And so it's not as it's, it's not the same as it used to be. Um, but I got out of that, you know, um, officially got out of it about eight years ago but um with those ties man that stuff carries you that, that carries with you everywhere you go and so when i eventually got out of prison uh my grandmother she didn't want to take me back to chicago so i ended up moving up to minneapolis minnesota uh, my mom by this time she got a little job up there at a prison up there and so i move up there and man didn't take long i was you know i found a bunch of the folks up there in minneapolis minnesota and that's when I started to realize that this thing is branched out. Like this thing is everywhere. You know, it's not just in Chicago or not just in Illinois, but man, it's all over the country, you know? Um, and the Midwest is, is flooded with Chicago gangs. It's like, it, you can't go anywhere without running into dudes from Chicago. And so um, that's what I mean. Like the reach is, is, is massive, <laughs> you know, um, you can't outrun Chicago. You know, so it's like guys will try to leave the city and end up getting caught up, caught up in another state. You know, it's like you you just you're like we got ears and eyes all over the place. The, the streets here and see everything, you know. And so mm. I moved up to Minneapolis. Like I said, got linked up with some of the folks up there. Um, I started DJing a strip club up there. And uh, one thing led to the next. Um, I ended up falling into to getting hooked on heroin. Uh, it was the last thing I ever expected to happen to me. Uh, but it happened and um and that's kind of what sent me on my journey with with heavy drug addiction you know all throughout the rest you know up until god saved me you know um but yeah but those those gang ties man they reach they reach all over like i said it's a network man mm -hmm. and so not yeah. even just in minneapolis st paul area but i end up moving down to tampa florida i'm um, just kind of running from myself at this point you know i was just I was still, I was very lost, you know, um, by this time, my grandma would tell me, she'd be like, you know, Sean, everywhere you go, there you are, you know, meaning it don't matter where you go. It's like, you bring you with you everywhere you go. So if you don't change, ain't nothing going to change for you, you know, and she, she's, she would tell me that, you know, and I'd be like, okay, grandma, you know, and I ended up moving down to Tampa, Florida, started running around down there on the streets down there. I got right back on dope caught a case um did did about three years up in jacksonville correctional center uh it's a high level high level gang camp down there because my gang ties like i said they follow you not just on the streets but also in the system in you know, the prison system um <clears throat> back then they had what's called an ncic gang database and so when you get locked up go to prison um and, and you're affiliated with a gang you go into a database and so that database follows you everywhere you go and so no matter where I go, it's like if I get pulled over, I got a red flag next to my name, you know, and, and legally um, two cops are supposed to come to the car, you know, and and so it's just all tight. You know, it's you're stuck in a system, you know, um, when you get when you get affiliated with a gang. And so with that, with that being said, that, that led me to the higher level camps, the mediums, the max prisons. I never I never been to a minimum level prison. Um, even though like most of my charges were, were like drug charges, concealed weapon charges, battery charges, stuff like that. Um, predominantly minor charges compared to a lot of the violent, violent stuff. Um, I had violent stuff in my history, but thank the Lord, I never really got, you know, busted for a lot of the, my violent crimes. And, um, I went down for more of the pettier stuff, you know, cause you know, I felt like I was slick, you know, felt like I, I could get away with just about anything, but 
so I ended up doing, you know, some time down in Florida and stuff like that. And, um, that's where I seen a lot of, you know, uh, just crazy stuff in prison, man, just guys getting stabbed up all the time, you know, uh, watched a guy get the back of a hammer into his head, you know, every week guys were getting airlifted out of there, you know, never failed. You know, the, the prisons are, they're ruthless, man. You know, um, they, they, they create a tough skin. That's for sure. You know, uh, I got guys that tell me today, man, you got like a lizard skin, bro. It's like nothing, nothing really faces <laughs> me anymore. Nothing really faces me, bro. Like, like I had, I literally have no fear, you know? And, and I see a lot of people operate in so much fear and I'm like, man, why? You know, it's like, dude, the enemy is a liar, dude. If you're walking with Christ, man, you, you're protected, man. You're covered, you know? Um, obviously not in ignorance, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's important to be led by the Holy spirit and to be led, you know, let God direct you and, and guide you in life, you know, but where God guides, he provides, you know what I mean? And, and so he he's provided protection for me, you know, and I look back and I'm like, man, I survived everything Satan tried to throw at me. And, and I just feel like, man, there's nowhere I'm not supposed to be today because of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. honestly, I mean, just hearing your story you know and the fact that like you're in front of us on the camera today i'm like wow you survived all of that like that's incredible like god totally protected you in all these unbelievably dangerous situations yeah um for sure you know uh i'm thankful man when i look back i feel like god's been saving me my entire life you know yeah i got many stories man i've been left for dead bro i've been shot at you know i've been you know i've been stabbed you know what I'm saying? I've been beat to a bloody pulp, you know what I mean? And and I still sit here today as survivor, you know, I, you know, as there's not a day I, you know, every day I tell guys all the time, it's like, I feel like my worst day today is better than my best day out there. You know, I, I just feel like there, there isn't anything that could, you know, obviously the enemy's, you know, he's a punk man and he's always throwing stuff at me and stuff. And, and so at, at times, obviously the old man tries to rise up, you know, I know over this last week up and up into doing this podcast, I've had a lot of a lot of attacks and stuff, uh, a lot of spiritual attacks and things like that. And um, I, I, I ended up, you know, some triggers and things rose up and, you know, I just stuff came out of me within this last week, man. It just had me kind of breaking and crying this morning before the Lord. Like, man, I don't I don't like who that guy was, man. Like, I don't like who he is. You know, he he hurt a lot of people. You know, and I don't want to hurt people today. I want to help people. You know, I don't want, I want to be an asset to the community, not a thorn in the side, you know? <laughs> oh, and you totally um, are. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you guys having me on here. And yeah, um, absolutely. That's, bro. That, that's something I've just been trying to be faithful and obedient to what the Lord's been calling me to do. And I feel like he's been calling me to reach others like me because you know, grow, growing up on the streets, man, for us, it's like, man, you walk out the front door, like all you have to look up to is those guys who are out there on the streets, you know, it's like, there ain't a lot of guidance for a lot of these guys. You know, I know my mom tried, you know, I know my grandmother tried, but like at the end of the day, I was just a broken, broken child. You know, yeah. I, I, you know, I'd been abused by my stepfather and like, you know, um, just dealt with a lot of stuff, man, in my family, but um, I feel like most of the trauma and stuff came from the, from the choices I made, you know, and. Um... Something that I, I just think is like striking in what you've been saying is that like, well, I had no idea that, you know, like these gang structures were so it sounds like a religion, you know, like what you're saying, it's truly, you know, it's like there's these rituals and there's like a liturgy and it's like this perversion of, um, uh, yeah, of religion. Um, but also more than that, just the fact that what they're offering to these, you know, young men who get involved or young women, I don't really know, but um, mm -hmm. it's something you said, you know, it's like being known and like being seen and this feeling of having a family and like, I'm, I'm assuming also like being protected, you know, but it's like, when you have that, it's like, I'll do anything for these people, you know, like I'll put my body on the line, I'll go to prison, but it's like, just that deep thing in our heart of like, I want to be known. I want to be protected. I want to be seen, you know? Um, I don't know how much love you felt, but like, I'm guessing that's like the thing that you are hungry for, you know? And so it's like, well, of course, if you don't know that from anywhere else and like, if, you know, if you don't know the Lord and you don't have these people in your life that are giving those things to you, like, of course, this thing is, is going to be alluring, you know? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, you nailed it on the head. It's all about acceptance. All I ever wanted in my life was to be accepted. You know, yeah. all I ever wanted in my life was to be told, hey, I love you. And like actually felt like they meant it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that's that that's what the gangs bring, man. They they bring, you know, they bring a family. They they really do. Yeah. It's like, you know, something happens to you. You got 30 guys. It's like, man, what's up? Let's ride. You know, yeah. it's like you got guys that are willing to ride for one another. And and it does something to you, man. It seduces you, man. It seduces you into into living a life that that really is, a, like you said, it's a perversion of, of God's truth. You know, yeah. all, all of it is. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I wouldn't take any of it back. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I learned a lot, you know, um, you know, I tell guys all the time, like a lot of thing, I, a lot of things I feel like the church is lacking is discipline in their life, you know, and, and with, with the gangs, they, they, they brought kind of a, a type of structure, a type of type of discipline to my life that, you know, um, obviously today in Christ, um, we operate in grace in love with one another, obviously long suffering, patience, kindness, gentleness and so i'm learning all of those traits but i'm thankful for the, the the disciplines i had because it's like if you don't act right man or you violate you get violated in the gangs you know what i mean they, they put their hands on you you know you catch a match stick or three and a half minutes you know and, and they'll mess you up if if you violate one of the laws or one of the rules or one of the guidelines in the gangs you know um it, it's hands-on you know and so that's what kind of makes the gangs, you know, as uh, um, just damaging in a lot of ways, but also, like I said, can create like a discipline in you. It's like I kind of feel like I have this template that I that I that I have um, that I've lived by for so many years that it's like the Lord's telling me a lot of that stuff isn't it, it isn't bad. It's just how we respond, how we react to these things is is what's important. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And so, but yeah, definitely as a family. You know, um, but now that I've actually experienced real love, like the agape love of, of of Jesus, like that true, that true, you know, like selfless love, um, man, that that changed my life. You know, yeah. it's like I feel like I had an experience that I'd always been looking for from the time I was a child, you know, that I now found in the Lord. Um, because all that love out there on the streets, man, it ain't real love. You know, it, it's a, it's a false sense of love. Cause when you get locked up, man, them guys ain't there for you. Ain't nobody there for you. When you lay in that cell and you hungry, you know what I'm saying? The, the only ones who are there for you are, are probably your family members. You know, th those who like, those who are actually in your life, you know? Yeah. And, and so, man, but I took advantage of my family growing up, you know, all they were for me was, you know kind of a paycheck when i needed them you know because like i said like the streets man it's a perversion of love it's like here go get right you know what i'm saying i got you but i'm gonna need something in return you know what i'm saying it's like there's there there's always circumstances you know what i'm saying like to 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 experiencing that love it's like you know you can't take anything for free out there on those streets because you're indebted to that person after that you know yeah yeah, all a perversion, like perversion of family, perversion of love and like acceptance and everything. Cause I'm assuming it's all very, yeah, it's all like very conditional, you know? So yeah. I'm just thinking of like, you know, in the body of Christ and we don't, we don't always do it perfectly. Right. Like people talk a lot in the church about how much we don't do it perfectly, but like, I think if you're really seeking the Lord and like really have the Holy spirit in your life, you know, the Bible says they'll know we're Christians by our love and like, and we should have that, you know, like we just met you, not even in person, but like, you know, like we can have this whole, like, no, like we would show up, we would, you know, like we would be there. And the Bible even talks about like, we yeah, Jesus talks about like, whatever you did for the least of the, you know, like I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. I was in prison and you visited me, you know? So, I mean, it's yeah. Like this unconditional, like we just love each other and everyone else, like, because God gives that to us unconditionally. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, I'm thankful the Lord brought me to Colorado because I, you know, I, you know, my family's all still back in Illinois and stuff, but I'm like, I, I know I couldn't be there. You know, yeah. it's just too much history, too many, too many ties, you know, too many people know me. Um, and that's not to say that God couldn't build me up and strengthen me to a point and send me back. Um, but at this point in my life, I'm thankful for the foundation that I've laid, you know, walking with walking with Jesus and and, and just really learning what it means to walk in a right relationship with him, you know, because um, that's really what it's all about. You know, it's it's not a religious structure. It's not you know, what I'm saying not about 
theology, even though theology matters, you know what I'm saying? But it's really just um, o- obedience to the Lord, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and walking in a right relationship with him. And, and yeah. so learning about all that, learning about relationship, learning about building relationships, learning about having healthy friendships in my life and stuff like that. And so that's been kind of my process is, it's been learning on uh, um, how to grow and, and write kind of healthy relationships, you know? Yeah. And and so I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, being out here in Colorado, being, um, being exposed to that, you know, here in Colorado Springs, they, they call it kind of like a Christian Mecca, which I think is kind of cool because they, they send a lot of missionaries, you know, all over the globe from right here in Colorado Springs. And so I've met some amazing, amazing men of God out here that I don't know if I ever would have, experience that hadn't the Lord brought me out here, you know? Yeah. And so I feel like God put examples in my life of what it looks like. Cause like I said, coming up on the streets is like, you don't have these, these, these healthy examples to look up to, you know? And, and so just being around men of God out here, like tough men, you know what I'm saying? Like, like you got a lot of military guys out here. You got a lot of, you know, you got a lot of ex gang members out here and stuff. who have all found the Lord. And I was just like, wow, like they exist. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And so, like, I'm just grateful that God brought me out here um, just to learn about all that and what that looks like and, and just learning how to love. Like you said, you know, it's like, man, love, love is it, it was a very foreign language to me growing up, you know, and, and even now, you know, I may, you know, I, I have this kind of roughness to me and stuff like that, man, but my heart bleeds love today. It's like, you know, just having that in my heart, man, like God truly turned my heart of stone into a heart of flesh, you know. And I'm just I'm grateful for that. Um, but then at the same time, the scales fell off my eyes. You know, uh, he, he revealed to me what he saved me from. You know, I've I've started to witness spiritual things like, you know, things that that really is like apart from, you know, um, salvation in Christ. Like we're blinded to the spirit. We're blinded to the spiritual things. Uh, we become seduced. We become driven by it. Um but we don't really, I don't think we fully really comprehend it until we find the Lord. And, and so that's, that kind of led me down that, that next stage of this kind of a rabbit trail down it just kind of learning the history of, of the supernatural and the spiritual s- stuff, you know, and um, when COVID hit and I just, um, you know, I took myself to school, you know, you know, I was uh, learning under Dr. Michael Heiser Um I remember praying to him one day. I was like, Lord, I don't, I don't want man's truth. I don't want the church's truth. I want your truth. I, I want the whole truth, nothing but the truth, you know, um, because I just felt like there was a lot of things that, you know, in in, in the church building itself wasn't really um, it wasn't really explaining a lot of the things that I had encountered. You know, like I felt like a lot of the spiritual stuff was very foreign to the church, even, you know. Um, we're, we're very rooted and in, in, in grounded in the gospel and in the spirit of the Lord and stuff like that. But when you come across these verses that talk about test the spirits, because they're not all from God, it's like, well, what is it? What do you mean? What do you mean? Test the spirits. There's other spirits, you know, and it's like, oh, well, the, the Bible talks about other gods. The Bible talks about principalities, powers, dominions, forces of evil. And I'm like, well, OK, well, I want to know about all that, because like. They, they they don't really go too detailed and obviously in the church about some of those things. And I wanted to know more about that stuff. And so I asked the Lord and that's when he led me to Michael Heiser and uh, ended up getting, I got all his books. I read all his books, you know, unseen realm, supernatural, you know, reversing Hermon, the angels and demons books and stuff like that. And that really sent me down a path out, out to the deep end, um, just learning about the history of the spiritual stuff. And then, um, all of a sudden it was like bells and whistles going off in my mind. I was like, oh my gosh, like everything that I had been involved in from the street started to make more sense to me. Yeah. You know, it's like, it started to connect dots for me that, that hadn't been connected before, you know? Um, and then I look up and look around me and I realize, oh man, like every city, every community is like, it's incorporated into everything. Mm-hmm. It's like, you look around you, man. It's like, you know, you start seeing a lot of these Masonic temples, you start, it's like, it's like, it's all hidden in plain sight, you know? And, totally. and so that really, that really like, um, opened me up to just kind of, um, what, what was going on in the world, you know, and, and just kind of the spiritual forces of wickedness that we really are up against. And, um, being out here in Colorado and then also learning through Heiser, just kind of the, just kind of the geographical dominion stuff. Um, I started to realize is like, man, 
that that stuff is everywhere. And then here in here in Colorado, I started to have encounters with a lot of um, satanic cults out here, like actual cults. And like I was used to the gang stuff, you know what I mean? Um, but then I started, like I said, like I, I had fallen off and met a witch out here. I started to realize like, man, this stuff is, wait, you guys are into this stuff too, you know, like, and, and so that's what really kind of opened me up to like what was going on. And um, man, I, I was like, Lord, I want to like actually see some of this stuff. And so, man, I've been seeing all type of supernatural activity since I've been living out here in Colorado, you know, and I feel like it's kind of enhanced my faith as far as like what I believe in, like, man, this is, this is, this is for real. You know what I'm saying? Like we really are shielded from, a, from what's really going on in the supernatural realm. And um, we're all seduced by it. We, we're all, you know, we all have, inf- we're all influenced by it in one way, shape or form, you know? And so for me, it just, it really like, it really like enhanced my faith in, in, in Christ getting to see and know about a lot of this stuff. Like I have, you know, Hey, Sean, what, what have you seen and experienced? You, you mentioned, you asked him to show you and you started seeing stuff. So tell us a little bit about that and tell us how learning from, from Heiser and taking courses. I know you've taken courses um, at the Awakening School of Theology. How has that impacted how you've dealt with your interactions with like, those cults and those things that you've been experiencing and in, in interacting with. Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, I learned the gods of the old Testament weren't fake for one. Um, you know, we have a tendency kind of to just skim through them and make, you know, we, we tend to think that, you know, they're just wood carvings in which the Bible says that pretty much they just, they are, they don't have any real power, you know, in them, in and of them themselves. But, um, Heiser just kind of opened up to me, um, just that, that, you know, they were, they were false gods and that, and, and with the whole dominion thing and just kind of the, the falls that Heiser talks about the three falls, Heiser talks about the fall in the garden. You know, he talks about the fall of Genesis six, you know, the fallen angels, the sons of God, the, and the watchers and, and the sons of men, and then the fall of Babel, you know, when, when God disinherited the nations, you know, out of disobedience and, um, he appointed them according to the numbers of the sons of God. And so when Heiser started to like, you know, put these pieces of the puzzle together for me, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, and so uh, it started off at, like, you know, you see a lot of just different activity going on in the skies and stuff. And so, uh, you know, I started digging into kind of the history of like aliens and UFOs and all that stuff. And I'm like, man, there's got to be a connection with this, you know, somehow, some way. You know, um, in which I, I can't sit here today and say that I I know for sure exactly what's going on out there, you know. Um, but I started to see a bunch of things, man, like orbs in the sky, um, different weird craft floating through the sky. And I mean, this is like I started seeing this stuff like sometimes every night, every other night. You know, I'd just sit outside and I'd be like, Man, I want to see something, Lord, you know, like and then I would see a craft just kind of go through the sky and I'm like, man, like I remember the first time I saw one, it, like I was standing on my back door. It was like four o'clock in the morning. This, the sun hadn't even come up yet. And I look up and I saw this craft go through the sky kind of super fast and it spooked me. And so I went inside. And I'm like, man, what did I just really see that? You know? <laughs> and so I'm like, man, that's crazy. So I started to just kind of pay attention a lot more. And so, man, like I've had encounters like driving down I-25 you know, blaring worship music. I look up in the sky and there's these orbs just kind of going from zipping through the sky. And I think I sent you a video. Yeah, you did. Yeah. (laughs) I tried to get the best I could, but I was driving in traffic, you know, and so I couldn't really, you know, get it. But like, man, I started catching this stuff and I'm like, man, this is wild. Right. Well, so my, my wife, um, she deals in community corrections out here in Colorado Springs. And, um, she started coming across clients that were dealing with, um, just uh, they're into a lot of the different cult stuff that's going on out here. Like the satanic, they got the satanic temple out here, um, out in Manitou Springs, they call it Wiccan capital. So, um, I have a little book, um, that talks about kind of just the spiritual stuff going on in Manitou and just the history of it and stuff. And so a lot of the, they got a lot of old castles. They got a lot of old structures out in Manitou that are, that are like, they're literally right down the road. So, 
like Colorado Avenue, you just followed up the road and you come into Manitou Springs and um, you just start seeing a lot of old, you know, it's a lot of history. There's a lot of history over there. Well, I started to kind of read into some of that stuff. And then my wife was coming across, you know, um, different clients and stuff that were involved in some of the stuff going on over there. And man, they got a lot of, uh, they got a lot of, you know, psychics. They got a lot of, um, they have the biggest actual, the biggest black mass church in Colorado is over in Manitou Springs. And so I started to like realize, man, like there's a lot of this stuff going on out here. Well, then, um, you know, we had uh, we had one of her clients one time that had, she had lost her brother out here um, in his car. He had died of a fentanyl overdose. And, you know, this is the whole picture that I was that we were talking about. Um, I'll just go ahead and go into that because this is what this is what. So my wife and I, my wife has a, a testimony, too. And and we both dealt with just kind of spiritual activity in our lives, whether it be through demons, you know, demonic activity or, or just dealing with other people who are possessed or whatever. Um, me growing up on the streets, I ran around the streets with a lot of, a lot of demon possession going on on the streets and stuff. And so I was familiar, you know, with, with a lot of that stuff. And, but, uh, we had a case one time where one of her clients, uh, her brother had passed away of a fentanyl overdose inside of his car. Um, and I guess a couple of weeks prior, he had went to one of the more haunted houses or something like that, um, down in Texas. And when he when he came back, um, he ended up going deeper into to fentanyl, ended up dying in his car. Well, uh, the sister took pictures of the car and we got these pictures back through an email and my wife showed them to me. She's like, look at this. And so I'm looking at these pictures and and in one of the pictures coming out the side of a car was was a demon. I mean, I, I mean, just clear, clear as day. I'd never seen one so clear in a picture like that before tori i actually i actually forwarded you the picture and guys if you're listening to this and you oh want to see goodness. this picture i'm going to post this on a uh, like a blog post at campramon.com so yep. what we're looking at and so you want to if you want to pull it up and look at it with us now um and sean i remember asking you like why they took the pictures and um it was like for like insurance reasons or something like that basically insurance reasons yeah because uh, so he had just bought the car like maybe a couple months prior like it was predominant like pr pretty much a brand new car um he had just graduated college was about to get married i mean he was not a drug addict i mean his you know the history his history is you know it's pretty pretty light you know like he didn't have much going on in his life but um, for some reason, something had led him into, you know, using fentanyl and stuff like that. And, and I mean, I, 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 I think a lot of it might've had to do with just some of the haunted houses and stuff that he was going into and dealing with it. You know, I, I feel like maybe that, in, maybe that influenced him a little, I don't know. I, it's, it's hard to tell, but I know, um, spiritually speaking, man, like, um, you know, the enemy can lead you into all kinds of darkness. <laughs> The, the, there are many avenues in into that and so it's it's for everybody it's different you know what i mean um but uh yes i, I do believe you know insurance purposes was the reason right. why they took pictures of the car yeah so what i'm looking at tori and i don't know if you can see it but do you see that on the right hand side oh yeah that that head um yeah. and <laughs> it's like it's this weird like grayish green um and I mean, it is, you could see the nose, it's, you could see the chin, the mouth. That's um, scary. You could see the lights from the porch next door shining off its eyes. Yeah, it yep. has like eye shine. Okay, so this is, I mean, so stuff like, I don't know, stuff that is scary, I guess, for lack of a better word, but like on a spiritual level, it's like my eyes just like gloss over with tears. It's just like, ah, like that's yeah. not just like a normal, like scary thing. I'm like, whoa. So there's more to so there's more to that story. So this was an ongoing case for a while, and um, I believe you know it's still kind of ongoing because of what has happened since then. So what happened was is my wife's client, um, she started you know preaching the gospel to her and wanted you know started invite wanting to invite her to church and you know just teaching her about Jesus and things like that. And um, at the same time, the family of the brother who passed away was starting to contact mediums out here in Manitou. And so um, because that started, like his family, I guess they were all in Texas still. 
Um, but they were they were get, trying to get a hold of like different people up here that could help them make sense of it, I guess. Like what what they were witnessing, and because th- this picture has has had it's freaked out their entire family, and so um, they're not saved. I think um, my wife's client, she is now, um, thanks to to my wife, um, you know, just influencing her and encouraging her and stuff. And so um, we're still praying, you know, f- over that. But at the same time, we started to notice um, there were high level witches that were coming that were stalking the family after all of this. And so because the mom and the and the other sister, I think we're 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 trying to get a hold of people, like I said, out here in Colorado to to help them make sense of it all. Well, because the church the 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 satanic churches out here, man, they're very forceful. You know, they they they'll they'll stalk you. They'll gang stalk you. You know, they'll they'll come to your house. They'll come to your job. They'll, they they try to get you to come to their churches. You know, they try to get you to come be a part of their organizations. This, this is how serious these these cults are out here in Colorado. And then we'll we'll kind of go into the whole 12 tribes thing here soon. But like, so we started to witness, man, like, like they, they started to show up to their to her job and she didn't know how they even knew where she worked. And like, so like she would never like nobody had ever told them any details about anything, but they were show they were coming and they were showing up. And so this is where my wife and I just started to intercede, started to pray, you know, in the spirit and tried to combat this thing in the spirit, because this is very much a spiritual war that, that we were dealing with here. Um, and so me personally, I had already been doing a lot of evangelism out on the streets. You know, you come across all type of stuff out here on these streets, man. And like. Like I said, I, I'm used to it. And so like I kind of have a thick skin when it comes to engaging darkness. You know, um, I just go out there with the light of Christ and I don't care what it is that tries to come at me. I just combat it in the spirit, you know. And but then, like I said, I started to learn a little bit more of what what kind of cults and satanic cults and things like that were out here. Um, and I'm the kind of guy, man, I do my homework. You know, I'm not the kind of guy that likes likes to read the surface, man. I like to go deep. You know, as you could tell, like getting into Heiser, that ain't no light work. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, you know, that's scholarship at its finest, you know? And and so that's just kind of who I am, man. Like I'm the kind of guy to just keep peeling, peeling the onion layer back. Like I want to know what's going on in the set. I want to know what's going on behind the curtain. You know, I want to see the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> you know? And so that's kind of what, that's kind of like my, what I feel like I've been called to do. Um, um, I, I didn't share this earlier, but I kind of want to throw this in there. Um I had came across Russ Dizdar. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Russ Dizdar from Shatter the Darkness. Um, he did deliverance on me literally through a podcast one day. You know, I remember listening to one of his podcasts and man, he just started speaking just like directly into a lot of this just kind of demonic activity and things that I ha- had been brought up with, but also that was kind of in in the gang stuff and just like, and it was wild. So I had went through this like deliverance one day through Russ Dizdar. Well, Russ sent me on that path of like figuring out, man, there's like a, a whole satanic army that's being built, you know, under the surface. And um, and so that kind of opened my eyes to see just see how 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 detailed and structured this thing really like the kingdom of darkness really was, you know. And so um I say that to say this, like that's what kind of led me on the path of like trying to go deeper into what kind of cults are going on out here. Um, because Colorado Springs is also a hub for, for human trafficking as well. Um, so, um, one of the cults out here called the 12 tribes, um, they were birthed out of the Jesus revolution. And I know we, that movie just came out, Jesus, Jesus revolution, the whole Chuck Smith story, um, and Greg Laurie and just that whole Calvary movement, you know, that, um, that, that kind of got brought up back in the hippie during the hippie times and stuff. Well, um, very similar to like the first and second century with the Gnostic organizations that rose up out of the, the first and second century church. I feel like it's like every time, you know, God, there's a supernatural move of God, a great awakening. I feel like the enemy tries to plant his little seeds in there too. And, you know, he'll rise up these organizations, these kind of Gnostic mindset, you know, organizations. And so, um, I found out about this, this group up here that's in Manitou. They own a coffee shop even out here. Um, it's a very popular coffee shop, but, uh, it's a group called the 12 tribes. Um, I ended up finding out that was like one of the bigger cults out here. 
uh, bigger movements. I guess they're one of their hubs is in California, one's here, and I think one's on the East Coast as well. Um, but then I started digging into it and I started reading a lot of articles and stuff into these people and they've been busted for, you know, for, for trafficking. They've been busted for, um, they, they, they've been busted doing rituals out here, like satanic rituals and stuff out here in the mountains. And so I I come to, that's where I come to find out. I was like, man, this is more than just like some underground activity, man. They're, they're doing these things right out here in the open. Like they're not hiding it. And I'm like, it just blew me away because I'm like, man, I, I come from a very silent and secret organization and these people aren't hiding anything, really. You know, like they, they run these coffee shops, they run these little houses and stuff and like all these. And I got the, like I said, I got a huge castle church right over there in Manitou and man, they plaster their little, you know, poster boards and things all over. And then like, you know, they'll have these little festivals and things going on in Manitou where they're just they'll do mock rituals and stuff in the streets and stuff. And I'm like, man, wow. You know? And so that's kind of where I started to get opened up to like, just like how severe and how, how prevalent it was out here. And so that's kind of how I got um, into just learning about a lot of this stuff. A lot of it came from like, like I said, that, that demon pick and that, that encounter we had. And so, and then also the stuff I was running into doing evangelism on the streets and so, but yeah, that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of that going on out here in, in Colorado Springs. So, you know, before we started recording, um, you know, we were talking about how, like, we don't want to glorify, you know, like a lot of this stuff, you know, that's like going on in the darkness and, you know, and how that's not the purpose of anything we're doing, but like, just, I don't know, to reaffirm what you're saying, it's like, to me, it, it just like invigorates my walk knowing that like the enemy is real and he's around, you know, I just feel like it makes it really hard to be like a sleepy Christian when you know that this stuff is happening, you know? And like Chris and I are kind of always investigating ways of like, okay, so we see in the old Testament and like in the new Testament and reading Heiser, you know, and learning about like, you know, the book of Enoch and everything. And it's like, okay, so there has been this agenda from the enemy from like day one and then seeing it play out in history. And it's like, you know, um, it, the enemy trying to stop Jesus from being born. And then like when Jesus was alive, trying to, you know, thinking that they won when they killed him and anyway. And and so Christians are so detached and like, well, that stuff was happening then, but it's not happening now, but it's like, okay, no, like we have gangs in Chicago that are like performing like rituals. And they have like this whole like (laughs) liturgy that's anti God. I mean, you know, I'm assuming, and it's like, there's gangs in Chicago and then there's like witches out in Colorado. And there's, it's just, it's just crazy to me how it's like, it's modern times and people don't think this stuff happens, but it's like, no, it's happening. And like Christians need to be awake and aware, you know? And to me, it's just kind of like the difference between taking a hike through the woods and just like picking little flowers on the way or being like, okay, no, we need to like have our eyes open. Cause there are like bears out here and actual predators. And like, we need to be smart and we need to like, you know, have some weapons with us and not just be operating all willy nilly in the world. You know. Well, this is the whole purpose for Christ, you know, and and, and this is what I, this is what I try to explain to people, especially those who are, are caught up in that darkness is like, man, there's a way out, you know, there, there, there is a way out. And, and because of what Christ did for us on the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection, like we now have power over these things. Like these things don't have to, you know, they don't have to control us. They don't have to bond us. They don't have to, you know, they don't have to, you know, dictate our lives anymore. Um, but yet at the same time, a lot of people don't even understand what it is that they're involved in. And, and that's why it is cool that you guys are doing that and revealing a lot of these things to people. Um, because I do believe it's a calling. You know, I, I don't believe everybody is called to engage a lot of these things. And that's because I don't believe a lot of people were brought up in, into understanding or knowing what it is and so that was it was a spiritual draw for me getting you know engaging in in a lot of this stuff um you know and so while at the same time i think it's good for us to definitely reveal a lot of these things um the bible does a good job of explaining it you know um to us you know what it is that we're dealing with the, the the supernatural the spiritual world that we live in you know um but yeah at the same time Um, I do believe it is a calling, you know, um, I believe everybody has a calling on their lives, 
Um, and I and I don't believe because when you get to dealing with these things, you're you're dealing with real supernatural spiritual seduction. And so it can entice and draw you away from the whole purpose of the gospel, you know, and I have watched that happen. And, and that's where it's like, even though I went as deep as I did, a lot of people around me, pastors around me and stuff like that were like, you, you need to maybe pull back a little bit on some of that. Um, because I, I started to witness people just really getting drawn away and it, like other things started to matter more than what mattered most, you know, in their lives. And, and that is the gospel. And that is a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with the Lord. Um, because at the end of the day, that's truly what sets us free. You know what I'm saying? Is 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 the gospel that's going to reach people. And yeah. also because there are a lot of people who are coming, who are just now getting to know Christ. Um, I think that too much of this for them could discourage them. Yeah. You know, it could cause them to go in another direction to be like, man, I'm good. I don't, yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's scary, man. It's scary. It's like, especially for those who don't have a mature relationship mature with the Lord. Faith. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I was just thinking, um, I had to look up the verse, but it's Matthew 10, 16. Um, it's Jesus speaking to the disciples, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So I think that's just it. You know, it's like knowing that we're sheep among wolves and like be aware of, of like the stuff that's going on out there. But like we say innocent as doves, you know, like just, <laughs> yeah. We're not sheep yeah, because among sheep, we're sheep among wolves. Lo- love ultimately is the greatest gift. You know, we've been gifted with love and, and love is what covers the multitude of sins um, in a person's life. It's it's ultimately what captivates, it's what penetrates the heart. You know, it, it, it's what bleeds into the very marrow of our bones. You know, it's 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 truly what can, you know, a lot of this stuff can bring anxiety for people too. you know, and I've noticed a lot of that. Um, having some of these conversations with people in the church before I kind of understood, you know, a lot of what this does to some certain people, you know, um, I've seen a lot of people get a a lot of anxiety, you know, or even start dealing with demonic activity, you know, and, and, um, and so that's where I come to find is like, man, I don't want to lead anybody into, into any, any dark encounters or any spiritual things that maybe they weren't called into, you know, or weren't called to deal with and stuff like that. And so where I do believe I was called to deal with some of that, you know, my wife and I both, we do, we do have a ministry in this area. Um, I've become a lot more uh, uh, wise, I guess you would say, when it comes to talking about certain things, um, definitely meeting people where they're at, kind of discerning what they can and can't handle. Um, but ultimately just pointing back to, you know, Christ you know, being the head, you know, of even all of these principalities and powers and dominions and rulers of darkness and things. And so just really ele- trying to elevate and glorify, you know, the gospel um, above a lot of these things, um, while at the same time revealing a lot of this stuff for people as well, you know. Mm-hmm. But I know that, you know, uh, Jesus came to bring a sword, you know, he didn't come to bring peace in the earth. He came to rightly divide the truth from the lie. And um, Jesus is the only place we can actually find peace in the midst of all of this chaos. Mm-hmm. And so even as Christians, and sometimes we think that we can handle this or we can handle that, um, all of a sudden we can start to entertain something. And all of a sudden we'll start to deal with that, you know, things in our lives. It's like, man, Lord, I, I why, why am I dealing with this anxiety? Why am I doing, de- I know you, I love you, Lord. Why is this stuff? And, and I think that's because maybe we start to entertain things more than we should you know if that makes sense yeah i think the more like the deeper i get into my walk with with jesus it's like the childlike thing you know and having childlike faith and just recognizing like the more you learn the more you're like i don't know and you know growing up and being like you know like oh i'm so sheltered like oh i i like want to see things you know but like my prayer lately has been more like Lord, like, you know what I can and can't handle. So like, I'm just trusting that like, if I'm not, like, if you're choosing to like not reveal this stuff, it's cause like, maybe I think I can handle it, but I really can't. So, you know, but like just putting yeah. those, those decisions in his hands, you know, like. Well, God, God blinds the minds of the believers, you know, it's the Lord that deals with us in those areas. And, and so I, I, I truly believe it's important for, 
to allow the Lord to reveal certain things to people without kind of force feeding it on people at the same time, you know, Sean. Yeah. Sorry. When you were talking about, you know, you got to be wise in you know, kind of how you uh, go out and look and say, I want to say looking for those, those encounters. Um, but you were, you know, you're talking about being wise in dealing with those, those things, those spirits and whatnot. It, it made me think of uh, the story in it's acts 19. Let's see. Uh, verse 13. It says uh, some Jews who went, who went around driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of, of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say in the name, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish mm. chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, Pretty brutal, man. Like, yeah, you know, we, we got to be wise in, uh, in, in how we're uh, dealing with these things. You don't want to just... Uh, you know, get all hype and, and want to have encounters with the, with demonic forces, you know, who want to be wise. Right. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, no, it just, it made me think of the seven sons of Skiba, which is just kind it's, of a hilarious story. And I believe not, not, not a lot of people actually desire it too. You know, the Bible really talks about having a desire for understanding the spiritual things, you know? Um, and I think it's important for us to, to, to desire the, those things from the Lord. And not and not for selfish purposes, you know, mm-hmm. understanding the advancement of the kingdom, the gifts that are given are for the edification and the build up of the body of Christ um, and not of self, you know. And so I think with like even the seven sons of Sceva, you know, I, I, I don't think they were out actually trying to glorify the Lord. I think they were out trying to just, you know, manifest gifts to glorify their own, you know, whatever selfish desires or wants and, and things like that. And right. um but yeah, wisdom, wisdom is definitely important because ultimately we're we're supposed to lead people to to the truth of the cross and, and not elevate ourselves, but to elevate the Lord, you know, yeah. in our lives and and then also allowing the Lord to be our our, our life of worship and, and, and everything unto him. Um it's very easy to get distracted and, and drawn away by a lot of this stuff and well, and I think, you know, just that, like, he's the light and, like, he's our source of power. And so I think, like, where people go wrong and, like, what you were saying when people go astray is that, like, they get all hyped and try to go, like, chase down this darkness. And they're like, oh, I'm going to go, like, conquer it. But I think, like, the real power is, you know, like, in being sheep that are close to the shepherd. And Sharon Gilbert gave a, a speech about this at um the Go There For conference. But, like, we are literally just sheep and, like, where our power is is standing next to the shepherd and so like when the wolves come around, it's not that we go seeking them out, but it's like just our proximity to the shepherd. You know, it's like when the stuff shows up at our doorstep, like we don't have to be afraid because the shepherd, because Jesus is right there. And like all we really have to say is like shepherd's going to take care of this, you know. So it's not that we're seeking it out, trying to like accomplish this stuff in our in our power. It's just that like if and when it comes to us, like mm-hmm. Jesus will handle it as long as like just our focus is like being near and staying near to him. Yeah. Not going out, like looking for it. You right. Know? Um, yeah. I know when I go out and do evangelism, I'm not, I'm not going out to look for demons right. necessarily. Right. I'm actually going out to share the love like, of Christ. to actually And looking help. for lost sheep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Jesus, Jesus leaves the 99 to get the one. And um, he uses us, you know, as vessels for that purpose. Mm-hmm. And really understanding that. That's why I tell people, even when I do things like this, like my prayer, even before this is like, Lord, I want them to see you way more than they see me. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And well, so we're going to transition into the uh, campfire chat. Sean, you're, you're more than welcome to, to hang out and join us. It's going to be a little more of a, a informal uh, kind of catching up between me and Tori. Uh, be happy to have you join us for for that uh, segment. Well, I probably won't like. be able to. I, I got to get my daughter to bed, and I still haven't had dinner or anything yet. And so, oh. uh, yeah, understood, man. Good. Well, Sean, I, I would, but yeah, I'm sorry. Um, don't be sorry. Family is 
I mean, that's the Lord's work. So, and you need to eat dinner. Well, that's been um, my blessing today. You know, I got asked, I just want to leave with this. Like I got asked, what is success in my life? And like success today for me, first and foremost is having victory in the Lord, you know, um, and also having the family that he's blessed me with that I desperately wanted for so long, you know, to be yeah. able to experience love from my daughter, from my wife. Um, man, that's success for me today, bro. You know, that's beautiful. Um, Sean, it's not planned yet, but we have like just in the idea phase, we really want to have a conference in Colorado next year. So if we do, we definitely need you to be there. So, <laughs> yeah, let me know. I'll be more than happy to be there. Be awesome. Yeah. 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 It's been so great talking to you. I appreciate it. Yeah. You guys were awesome. Thanks for having me once again. And uh, I look forward to all that the Lord has in store. I pray blessings over you guys' ministry, that the Lord would continue to provide. He continue to lead and direct um, your path as um, it's important for us to, to follow the Holy Spirit, you know, um, first and foremost. And um, he's the one that goes before us. And so, that's something I always think about trying, you know, in my zeal, in my passion, sometimes we can have a tendency to get ahead of the Lord. And um, I know I've, I've made that mistake before. And so, you know, I just pray that, you know, we all just continue to be obedient to and walk in the footsteps in which he had placed before us. And so, Thank you. Yeah. God, God bless, bless you guys. You and your ministry yeah. too. You too, Thank bro. You. Hey, hey, really quickly before you go, if anybody wants to, to connect with you or get in touch or anything like that, uh, where, where can they find you? If you so want to be Sean found. Ray, I'm on Facebook. Um, if you want to reach me, reach out to me there. Uh, like I said, we have a ministry called wrong to strong. Um, so I have an Instagram called wrong to strong Colorado. I recommend follow me on there. I do. Um, I do a lot of uh, little ministry things on there. Uh, I like to post just kind of encouraging videos and, you know, Bible verses and stuff like that. But, so Instagram, Wrong to Strong Colorado, um, uh, Facebook, Sean Ray. So you can get a hold of me there. And uh, if anybody needs prayer or, you know, or anything, just reach out. Awesome. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, brother. You so we appreciate you. All right. Uh, if you are a member, stick around for the Campfire Chat. If you're not a member and you want to support what we're doing here at uh, Camp Hermon, you can go to camphermon.com, uh, sign up to be a member. Um, we we appreciate your support. All right, camp on Tori. Camp on Chris. Until next time. Peace. Hey. Came down to top vanity, brought the proliferation of humanity. A fallen sons and the most high God took advantage of the planet he made, forming a holy alliance of evil. And look at the daughters of Adam and Bain. That the flood rain came to restore his creational order to how we arrange.